here. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. If you are joining us online on the International Space University YouTube channel. So today, this is our fifth event, actually, that we are uh, streaming online since the beginning of the summer. Many more to come. And I noticed that it was saying a, a distinguished lecture in some of the brochures. Definitely, it's not a lecture that we are experiencing tonight. It's really, if I may call, a fireside chat. So we have two distinguished speakers, uh, guests here tonight with us. And we will actually just, you know, listen to them, enjoy their conversation, and then, you know, we will include the public here to that conversation uh, with questions and answers. As you can see, and oh, this is me, okay. This is not uh, what I want to advertise. We have two guests, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Jim Green, uh, and Michael Benson. Very briefly introducing them to you before handing them the uh, stage. Jim Green is the senior advisor in the office of the chief scientist at NASA. Prior to this appointment, uh, he had been a NASA's chief scientist. He received his PhD in physics, uh, space physics, uh, from the University of Iowa in 1979 and began working at NASA's Marshall Space Center where he developed and managed NASA's first internet the Space Physics Analysis Network. And from August 2006 until April uh, 2018, Jim was the director of the Planetary Science Division at NASA headquarters. Under his leadership, more than a dozen planetary missions have been successfully executed, including the New Horizons spacecraft uh, flyby by, uh, of Pluto, the Messenger spacecraft off to Mercury, uh, the Juno spacecraft to Jupiter, the Grail A and, one, uh, A and B spacecraft to the moon, the Down spacecraft to Vesta and Ceres, the landing of the Curiosity rover, and the InSight lander onto Mars. He has written over 125 scientific article, uh, articles in refereed journals about Earth and planetary science, and over 50 technical articles on data systems and networks. In 2015, Jim helped coordinate the NASA involvement with the film The Martian. So give Jim a big applause, please. Thank you very much, Jim, for joining us. My pleasure. And our second guest today is uh, Michael Benson. Uh, so Michael Benson's work focuses mainly on the intersection of art and science. As an artist, a writer, and filmmaker, in the last decade, Benson has staged a series of large-scale shows of digitally reconstructed planetary landscape photography in major museums around the globe. His last book, Space Odyssey, Stanley Kubrick, Arthur C. Clarke, and the making of a masterpiece was published on the 50th anniversary of the release of the famous movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, in April 2018. He is currently using SAM technologies, which is scanning electron microscopes, to focus on natural design at sub-millimeter scales for a project titled Nanocosmos, which he is realizing at the Canadian Museum of Nature in Ottawa. Michael Benson is a fellow of the New York Institute of Humanities, a Weizmann Inst Institute advocate for curiosity, and a recent visiting scholar at the MIT Media Lab. Please also welcome Michael Benson. Thank you. Floor is yours. Enjoy. Excellent. Thank, you. Thank um, you so much, G2. While Michael gets ready, let me uh, <laughs> mention a few things about this absolutely uh, spectacular movie. Uh, I actually was in high school uh, using a 12 inch Alan Clark refractor when it came out. Uh, I also uh, enjoyed Star Trek on TV, I also uh, did astrophotography. So my world, uh, I was immersed in science and science fiction. I immediately realized that for us to be able to have a future, we have to be able to think about it. And that includes science fiction. And in the representation of movies, the opportunity to visually stimulate our thinking. And this movie does that. Uh, I would say that more than 95% of what we're going to talk about tonight, what you're going to see in this movie, was not created at the time. It was guessed at, it was mocked up, it was, had some ideas, and um, we'll talk about how well they did it. The movie holds up really well. I'm hoping uh, you'll enjoy tonight. 
uh, as G2 mentioned, uh, we like to call him G2 as a, you know, it's a, it's a term of endearment. Uh, R2G2. Yeah, R2G2. <laughs> Uh, uh, Michael has uh, written extensively. He's, he, he knew Arthur C. Clarke, talked to him for many years before even the concept of the book came out, and he knew Stanley Kubrick's widow. And uh, 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 Stanley, unfortunately, passed away early. Uh, and once you're given the opportunity to write the book, it still took you several years. And, and indeed, what we'll be doing is uh, talking about a lot of those backstories that you uncovered. And I've got a question of the audience, which is how many of you have not seen 2001 here? It's okay. It's okay. Okay. So um, what I would say is please treat this as just a taste, a little taste, and hopefully not a spoiler alert situation. And, but please do, well, we'll see what you think of it after this discussion. But uh, please see it on a big screen when you can and, you know, Turn off your phone, you know, close the door, lock the door, and watch the whole thing straight through right. on a big screen if you possibly can. Because uh, I know Stanley Kubrick, I never met him, but I, I know that he would be furious at work, what we're doing tonight <laughs> because he, he wanted his films projected perfectly with no discussion on either side and so on. However, it is now more than 50 years later, yeah. so I guess it's okay. That um, is quite the classic. Right. So what you see on the screen right now is Arthur C. Clarke, the great British science fiction author. He's most famous for science fiction, but he was also a great advocate for spaceflight in nonfiction, many nonfiction articles in the mid-20th century. And, of course, Stanley Kubrick uh, in, the, in that lift elevator gizmo there under the caution weightless condition sign. And these two very different characters, but in, some, in many ways equal, equally brilliant, collaborated between 1964 and 68 to make this film. Um, Kubrick had had great success with Dr. Strangelove, his Cold War satire, which was released just prior to 2001, uh, just prior to 2001, 2001's production commencing. And um, the commercial and critical success of Dr. Strangelove permitted MGM to make the calculation that it might be worth risking uh, putting a big budget into a science fiction movie at a time when science fiction was considered only slightly above pornography in the accept social acceptability scale. So sci-fi was really, uh, previous well, sci-fi books were, are another story, but in general, sci-fi movies were mostly considered B or C movies. Right. So doing a serious science fiction movie was almost an oxymoron when they started, you know. And um, before we start rolling, uh, going through some slides, I would just point out that the one effect of 2001 A Space Odyssey, which was a commercial and critical success as well, uh, four years later in 68 when they finished it, was that Kubrick and Clark changed the Hollywood paradigm, which had been the Western, until this film came out. And after this, the, the, this film came out, the science fiction spectacular became the reigning Hollywood paradigm. So now that is the, the mark of a major artist who could change an entire industry's modus That's operandi. Right. So, oh, one more thing. So there are a number of, of clips in this presentation, and, and what I propose we do is let them roll from beginning to end. They're just excerpts, sometimes several minutes, and we're not going to talk over them. We're going to let them, we'll respect the film, let them play, and then we'll talk after, okay? And we need some...
So what do you think we just saw, Jim? Well, this is a, a typical Kubrick over the whole film. Uh, y there's not much dialogue. In fact, uh, Arthur C. Clarke complained that he wrote thousands of pages and words of di or, you know, dialogue, and Kubrick never used those. But uh, uh, indeed, here we combine, obviously, something that has uh, been placed where um, ancient humans may have started that is inspiring, that is something that says, uh, uh, please come, please move out into the solar system, but you have to start with an idea. It's the dawn of an idea. And it's the dawn of the movie, and it's the dawn of modern man. Well, yeah, so uh, just prior to the sequence, I didn't want to show the whole thing. The first of several titles in the film says, The Dawn of Man. And um, the premise is that we're looking at pre-human primates, Australopithecus africansis, um, and the premise in the film is that they're starving, and they just don't really, they're not as well adapted as they could be in, in, in drought conditions. And so this mysterious monolith appears, and there's one of many, one of several celestial alignments in the mm -hmm. film, and it seems to spark some conscious reflection in this lead man ape played by Dan Richter, the American mime, who's a friend of mine. He's still with us. <laughs> Great guy. Um, and um, the, the idea is that the monolith was the instrument, this mysterious monolith, possibly of extraterrestrial origin. We'll find out later that it was in the film. Sparked the idea of using a bone, a heavy bone, as a, a weapon, tool. as a tool. So right. this is the first tool, which is a weapon, the arrival of the first tool. And then later, we're not going to show the whole movie, obviously, and I wanted to uh, go to this slide. So these are actual um, tools found on Lake Turkana in Kenya that date to 3.3 million years ago. Um, they're flakes used for cutting. Um, and they also found hammers and anvils, big heavy blocks that were used presumably to create these chips. Um, and they're 700,000 years older than previous finds. So it's interesting. Clark himself commented later, you know, when he was interviewed about the film, that they had set their pre-humans, primates, two million years in the past, but that discoveries kept on taking them further back. You know. um, and so I thought it would be instructive to show the actual first tools that we, we have discovered. Um, and at the lower right, by the way, is a wax figure done by the French sculptor Elizabeth Dynes of Australopithecus africansis. And you can see we're talking about, um, there's a spark of intelligence there for sure. Uh, well, this is, not, this is not Homo sapiens at all. Um, now, on the right is Dan Richter. He was, uh, he was a, um, uh, lead, the lead actor in the American Mime Theater in New York City in 62-3 in, in uh, and decided he wanted to hit the hippie road and, and you know, see the world, do, do some drugs, go to Japan, learn about Japanese theater. Uh, and he ended up in London and he heard about a production being shot at MGM Studios, Boreham Wood, just north of London, by Stanley Kubrick that needed some help because Kubrick had been trying without success to make this, this prehistoric scene, sequence. It was the end of the production of 2001, but it was the first scene, sequence in the film. Right. And he was having real trouble because he kept on putting people in ape suits and they looked like human beings stuffed into ape suits. Right. So imagine, you know, the first the first Planet of the Apes movies where it was palpably human beings in apes. And, and Kubrick was such a stickler for accuracy, precision. Um, he was such a uh, researcher. Uh, he spent, each of his films was a research project. 2001 was the absolute ultimate example of that. Yeah, four years. Four years of work. And um, anyway, so Dan Richter, not to talk too long about this, Dan Richter went for a meeting. He had no idea, you know, he didn't know anything about what he was to expect um, and had a conversation with Kubrick. He immediately liked Kubrick, the two New Yorkers. He wasn't in awe of Kubrick like a lot of people or freaked out. You know. And Kubrick said, well, we've got this problem. Explain the whole thing. 
And Dan said, well, I think I could help you because the point is to incarnate pre-humans, not clothe in, clothe them in, 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 in skin yeah, and then right. pretend we are. It's the, the point is to become them. Um, on the left is one of um, the absolutely extraordinary final uh, suits, um, if you could put it, if you could call it that, um, produced by um, Stuart Freeborn. Uh, now, Stuart Freeborn is the only guy there who's not an Australopithecus. <laughs> And he's, of course, cleaning lice from the hair of the other you know, primates there. Um, and Freeborn is, you know, should be more famous than he is because he was also later, he did the Wookiees for Lucas, and he did many other extraordinary things in his career. But I would contend that his uh, working with Dan to create these, um, these pre-human ancestors of ours was, was right. his great, greatest achievement because they, it was all done totally analog. There's nothing digital going on here. We're, we're in 67. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. It's all pre-CGI. Way I mean, pre-CGI. You know, you know, we're talking uh, Jurassic Park. You know, eight minutes of CGI in Jurassic Park. Yeah. 1992 when that really started. Yeah. And interestingly enough, CGI dates really rapidly, whereas 2001, we can get into this a little later, and I hope you agree, a lot, it, it mostly it has not dated. It has not, it, I mean, I, I would say it looks very contemporary or even still futuristic right. now. Right. Should we get to another yes. Uh, clip? Yes. What's next on your agenda? So now they have the weapons.
couple Large of things. Large space structures, wow. I mean, we haven't built structures like that. The vehicles that look like the shuttle. Yeah. Uh, the walls is fascinating in the sense that it is a dance between the spacecraft and the spinning station to yes. be able to come in and, and yes. dock. And yes, dock. actually I have a little story about that, which I'll get to in one minute, but, but I wanted to point out that um, um, one of the conflicts, one of the sources of a, a certain amount of tension between Arthur Clarke, who was very literal and wanted to spell things out for the reader or, or viewer, because he also did a novel, and Kubrick was that Kubrick at every every point when he could have spelled things out more, he 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 opted for ambiguity. One reason for 2001 staying power is the ambiguity. Um, this, and there's um, plenty of it. Tantalizing ambiguity. Um, so that bone weapon rising, which was match cut with a spacecraft, it wasn't spelled out that those were orbiting nuclear devices. If you look closely, you'll see little national markings on them, but it's not spelled out. And in a way, it doesn't matter. It's a tool to a tool. It's, it's the first tool to what we would consider an ultimate tool of our civilization. Um, but it was a weapon to a weapon as well. Mm -hmm. And so uh, on the top left, you see one of, the weapon, one of those 2001 spacecraft weapons that was not used, which I found in my research. And on the lower right is an is a artist's depiction of an American hypersonic nuclear weapon. So it's not as if we have gotten beyond some of the problems that were being presented subtly, you know, and overtly in 2001, right? Yeah. Indeed. Militarization yeah. of space. Right. And so it's forth. Still, it's still a major topic of discussion, and we have to work really hard yeah. to prevent that. Yes. And then when it comes to, oh, I'm changing this. I should be changing that. Um, so this is the vocabulary. These are two models, the two key model, two of the key models in 2001, which, are, which I got very high quality scans of photos of the models. This is, this is not from the film. I mean, it is from the film, but it wasn't used in the film. And, you know, I don't know, those of you who were at my talk earlier today know I was talking about this sort of vocabulary and syntax of spaceflight that emerged in the mid-20th century um, in which a wheel-shaped space station, um, which could create artificial gravity by spinning, was, you know, was constructed and, and rendezvoused with, rendezvoused by, with uh, space shuttles, a space shuttle. So 2001 continued with this Werner von Braun and, and uh, Hermann Potochnik Nordung vocabulary of spaceflight, and, and in a way they passed it on to NASA again, you know, and, which developed the shuttle and, and, sure. and, and then built a space station, maybe not a wheel-shaped mm -hmm. one. So here I just wanted to show, um, for those people who weren't at the, my talk earlier, so this is um, a design of a space station published in 1928 uh, by the Slovenian uh, Habsburg spaceflight visionary Hermann Potochnik Nordung who designed a wheel-shaped space station way back when um, in, in great detail. And clearly 2001's wheel is, is, uh, d it derives from this um, early first quarter of 20th century design, which Werner von Braun shamelessly lifted and put, in and, and, and put into Disney and put it in Colliers and didn't really give credit where credit really should have been given. But OK, Slovenians are used to that. <laughs> Um, okay, so what else would? Oh yes, so and there, there's there's Werner von. So that on the top left is Nordung's book in which he proposed geostationary orbit for large Earth orbiting wheel-shaped gr artificial gravity producing space stations. And on the lower right is Werner von Braun in in a Walt Disney special in in uh, the mid in mid 50s pointing to a shuttle which uh, was mounted at the very top of the stack, which turned out to have been a very good idea. Um, he was also not for solid fuel boosters, but that's maybe another discussion, Jim. What do you think? Um, he was against solid fuel boosters because they couldn't be turned off, and he thought maybe the shuttle should be at the very top so that falling chunks of ice and, and so forth couldn't hit it. Um, but let's not get into all those weeds. Okay. Oh, um, the Blue Danube. 
So one yes. last little detail about that scene. So I got to know Christiane Kubrick, Stanley's widow, who's a fantastic woman, lives in this vast mansion north of London. And we were talking about 2001 and Stanley and, and how he made the film and everything. And, um, and she told me that basically on their first date, I mean, they'd gotten together in Munich during the production of Paths of Glory, um, one of Kubrick's great films, war movie, about the First World War. And they got together, and then they went for a long weekend to Vienna, which wasn't that far from Munich. Mm -hmm. And Vienna has, Vienna plays a lot of waltzes in public parks and everything, and Vienna has a Ferris wheel. Still has. It still has it. And, and she told me they went on it, and, you know, and they always played the Blue Danube <laughs> when, they, when that Ferris wheel ran around. And she didn't explicitly tell me that we heard the Blue Danube there and so forth. But I think it was one of those subliminal things that seeped into Kubrick's consciousness later when he was trying to figure out what music to use. And, mm -hmm. of course, it's a waltz. It's a dance anyway. True. Between the shuttle and the yes. station to land. Okay. He really wants you to uh, feel that uh, space flight and uh, uh, moving off the planet has now gotten to be so easy to do. Routine. So, routine. Routine. There's a Hilton Hotel up there, by the way. <laughs> now, that would be nice. Um, exactly. Um, by the way, that furniture is a famous Finnish furniture designer's work, and um, the, the production design team of 2001 was not above taking modernist designs that they, they liked mm -hmm. and just popping them right into, the, mm -hmm. into their production, although most of what you see is designed from the ground up by, by this yeah. incredible team that Kubrick uh, assembled. Now, one point, uh, so Jim, when we were discussing this discussion yeah. earlier, um, you mentioned... Um, Hardy Ames, or Amis, I don't know how to pronounce it, I should know, but um, the Queen's dressmaker <laughs> yes. in the 50s and 60s, right. and, and even in the 70s, he still had, he's in the lower right. left there. He was hired by Stanley Kubrick to do the costumes of 2001, and Stanley asked him to go off and do some meditating about what clothing would look like, you know, 30 years in the future, and... And he was very intelligent, and he went off and he thought about it, and he looked at designs from 30 years before, and he noticed that there weren't major changes, really. And so he proposed to Kubrick that he would make some modifications and, you know, tweak things, but it wasn't going to look sci-fi and, you know, wild. And, you know. Um, and Kubrick accepted that. However, um, the stewardess costumes, of course, are a little different because they are for a zero gravity environment. Right. You see there in the, in the bottom, which uh, he saw, talked to as he as he arrived. Yes, and so um, now one thing about women and Stanley Kubrick films in general, there aren't that many of them, and, and there are not major characters typically. So that that was Stanley Kubrick and and his one of his limitations. In 2001, there are very few women. Um, and and what, what you have is some stewardesses taking care of the, the males who are going off sure. to the moon. Actually, they look like Pan Am stewardesses. They're Pan Am stewardesses. Yeah. But you also have these three Russian women, all Dr. Smyslova, Dr. So-and-so, and Dr. So-and-so. <laughs> all three are PhDs coming mm -hmm. back from the moon. And I attribute this to uh, Clark's influence. I don't know this directly, but Clark was very aware of Soviet um, kind of 
um, ideology and, and, you know, the Soviets were really pushing and hyping that they had a more equal society mm -hmm. than the corrupt mm -hmm. capitalist West. Mm -hmm. and, and they also, um, to their credit, sent the first woman That's right. uh, to space, um, Valentina Tereshkova. Um, in June 1963, she orbited for three days, and she's still the only, uh, the only woman to have had a solo space mission in the history of, of space flight. So I did want to mention that, that you do have three women who have doctorates, and they're not just serving food to the, right. to, you know, you know right. taking the pen out of the air, the weight, zero gravity, the weightless pen out of the air for the more important person who's sleeping there in the, in the Pan Am shuttle. But this back and forth is really important between Clark and Kubrick. Yes. Uh, in fact, the two of them wanted that. Oh, yeah. Clark is oh, yeah. actually working on the novel while Kubrick is developing the film. The film comes out before the novel comes out. Actually, you know how, the, how it started? Is that Kubrick and Clark were going to be co-authors. Kubrick wanted to be co-author with, with on the Arthur book. Clark on the book. And so at first they were supposed to be co-authors, but of course Arthur was the one writing the words. And, and, but they, were, they had a meaningful collaboration yeah. where they really were trading ideas. And um, one of the descriptions of Kubrick that almost everybody that I know I've met who, has, who knew him used with Kubrick is that he was like a sponge. He would absorb you, what, if he found you interesting, he would want to download the contents of your brain into his brain. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and so what went on with Kubrick and Clark in 2001 was a kind of mind meld. It was one of the classic 60s collaborations, I would say. Mm -hmm. It's not Lennon and McCartney exactly, because there weren't many, many films. But it, but it had this interesting uh, dichotomy uh, and power, because they were very different personalities. Right. Kubrick was, in some ways, very cynical, uh, or let's say realist, and, and a bit cool mm -hmm. about the human condition. Mm -hmm. and, and Clark was famously a utopian uh, uh, optimist. He was sort of Pollyannish, yes. if I may use a term. Yes, you may. <laughs> <laughs> um, he was very optimistic. I mean, he was skeptical also. I mean, he was not, he, was, he wasn't, he was well, an interesting Well, they each brought guy. something to it. And yes. Kubrick did indeed change his opinion when he thought, it, when he was exposed to something he thought was even better. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Kubrick, I've compared Stanley Kubrick to a great jazz band leader. Meaning, and by the way, Stanley Kubrick played jazz drums in the 50s, and, mm -hmm. and Christiane told me that there was a drum set in one, of the in one of the rooms of their mansion throughout the production of 2001 and well into the 70s, mm -hmm. and, and when, when, when Kubrick needed to blow off steam, he would play drums. <laughs> and um, the, the hallmark of a good jazz band leader and the whole you know, rationale of jazz is that each of the players you know, has maximum respect, and, and there's a leader, but you know, they they're, share. they're soloists. They share in they're, the yes. solo. And so Miles Davis, there is absolutely no doubt that he controlled that band, and he was, a, he was an enlightened despot yeah. Yeah. of the band. And I've compared Kubrick, actually, to, to Miles Davis in the sense that he knew how to find the best players and collaborate with them and get their ideas and deploy them in his art. Mm -hmm. you know? And 2001 is a great example. It is. Um, one more picture here before we get into another clip. So that is the outside of that space station set that we saw, you know, it looked kind of gleaming and nice and a set, you know, and just you know, nice set, but a set. But it was 150 feet long, 30 feet wide. It cost a vast amount of money. Um, it had 100 watt Fresnel lights hanging in ranks, in rows uh, above it. It was extremely hot inside, of course. Um, this allowed um, very fine grain film stock. This is all technical. Um, and Clark visited the set. Clark would go back to Sri Lanka, then called Ceylon, and fly into London, and then go back to Ceylon and sulk and then fly in. You know, because, you know, by the time the film was in production, a lot of his work had already been utilized, although he continued adding, adding, adding uh, ideas and then, during the production. And another thing to say about 2001 is that very unlike most films, and you know, very rarely do you have a film that goes into production without an ending, without a finished yeah, script. Right. That's another jazz comparison. It, there, a lot of 2001 was an improv. But the point I wanted to make about the, that shot is that 
I found a letter from Clark to, to actually his boyfriend um, at the time, and, and he said, I saw the set in stage, stage three in, in Boreham Wood. You know, I don't think this film is going to be, you know, $2 million. I think, you know, I mean, he, you know, he, it's not even a major scene, you know. So, right. so you, can, you get a sense of the scale of ambition just from the outside in a way more than you get from right. seeing the inside. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But the effect inside is wonderful. I mean, the effect inside. And also, I, I have other photos which I don't have here, but because it curved up, and it was in One Earth Gravity, by the way. It was mm -hmm. in England, actually. <laughs> uh, actors would walk up to the ends, and suddenly they're, you know, <laughs> they're, they're leaning they're forward. An angle, and, and, right. and in fact, uh, vertigo resulted inside that thing. Um, one actor was quoted as saying that he got up to the top, and then when he, and it was fine, but then he turned around, and he had to sit down because he was so disoriented, you know, because of the curving yeah. uh, right. station uh, segment. Okay. Again, visually stunning. I mean, you know, and, and unbelievable. Yeah, the the original view where you're seeing you actually uh, take that, you then realize in the second view that the whole system is moving and at a rate that he's walking and he does so well, you know, making it feel like okay, I'm I'm really working up now. I'm slowing down now. I'm gonna yeah. speed, up. <clears throat> and then the the elements that are around, you know, other coffin-like systems that are there. Hibernoculums, <coughs> yep. they call them. Uh, Egyptian-like tombs yep. with... with um, <coughs> clearly, well, clearly men and women in stasis. Yeah, and I cracked up when uh, Kubrick's <coughs> brother-in-law told me that he called them the popsicle people <laughs> inside who <laughs> were frozen. But um, so that shot, nothing like it had ever been seen before on the screen, and nothing like it has been seen since. I suppose there's lots of stuff going on in CGI. So what you see there on the screen now is this 38-foot diameter centrifuge. It was built by Vickers Armstrong, which is the same company that built the Spitfire for the second half of the Second mm. World War. First it was Supermarine, and then it went to Vickers. So they hired an actual aviation, uh, a serious firm, to, to build this thing, because it, this is a serious piece of, of kit here. And this was to use a Britishism. <laughs> um, and this was one of the most expensive sets that had ever been built. Um, it was certainly the most expensive set in 2001. I don't have the figures in front of me. But the way they shot that Mobius strip kind of effect with the astronaut, first you see him running towards you, and the camera seems to be on the floor. Then he seems to run up the wall. And then, That's wait right. a second, he's upside down. So the ca where's the camera then? And then he runs back down. That was accomplished by um, that. The, the actor playing the astronaut was actually always at the bottom of the centrifuge. Um, and the camera was on a blade that fit through, a, fit in a slot um, between the two sides. OK, that's not going to work. Um, between the, the, the centrifuge had two sides and it could open up you know, almost like a film reel box. 
and, and then there was a slit on the floor all the way around, and then there was a blade that stuck through the floor, and the camera was put on that blade, and the camera sure. went around. Followed him. Yeah, yeah and sometimes, the there, sometimes there was a dolly put on the, on the blade, and, and the whole wheel turned, and the dolly was ahead of mm -hmm. the running astronaut mm -hmm. and making it seem like yeah, this, he was this running in a circle. This scene was so ingrained in, in your thinking that um, uh, there's a very famous event that happened uh, for Skylab astronauts. Yes. And uh, indeed, um, uh, this is uh, uh, the United States' first space station. Uh, uh, and I was, uh, this was told to me by uh, one of the engineers who was uh, on call at that time. Two in the morning, uh, he was woken up, told, you know, get in, there's something wrong with Skylab. <laughs> it's nutating. And so that means it's moving in a very unusual manner, you know, something like this. And um, uh, so they all come in and, and uh, uh, begin to talk to the center director about what it could be. And, and uh, they were coming up with all sorts of oddball things. And the center director said, okay, we, we got to wake up the crew. Got to wake up the crew. They all should be sleeping. It was the sleep time. And get them involved in solving the problem. And they okay. were out of breath. <laughs> yeah, and they call them up, and they're running on the inside like Gary here. And, hamster you know, wheel, the yeah, hamster yeah, wheel. Yeah, they were doing that because that's what they saw in 2001. And, of course, the center director said, stop that, go to bed, <laughs> send his crew home, and the what spacecraft stopped mutating. Yeah, right. Well, there's footage of that, you know? Mm -hmm. Have you seen yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's quite incredible that actually when they picked up velocity without needing to spin the station, their actions would create the artificial gravity. They're running, creating mm -hmm. the artificial. Yeah. And, and one of the questions, um, by the way, that's Kubrick on the right playing Mission Control. He was, in the, you know, <laughs> director. Cap, he playing was Capcom. Director. Yeah, yeah. He was Capcom <laughs> there. Um, Run faster, Gary Marshall. <laughs> one of the, um, one of, so what you see in 2001 repeatedly is artificial gravity being produced. And one of the, one of the things that I found frustrating throughout my long history of being a fan of space flight and, and watching what NASA was doing and what the Russians were doing and later on the Chinese and so on and the Europeans was there was all of this discussion about bone mass loss deterioration et cetera et cetera et cetera and and almost never did you hear the topic of artificial gravity being um, mm -hmm. being mooted being discussed mm -hmm. and I always wondered about that um, now I understand with the ISS you don't have artificial it's gravity not it's not spinning it's a microgravity environment yeah. and it's a laboratory for microgravity right. okay. But when it comes to long duration missions to Mars, for example, where you really want your, you want your astronauts ready for at least Mars yeah, gravity yeah. when they arrive, wouldn't yeah. it make sense to have a spinning? So, spinning great out? idea, great idea. Yeah. A lot of research left to do in that area. NASA's been talking about it for a while, and actually um, uh, there may be a couple experiments coming up over the next few years. But in reality, it's tough. Because yes. if you're moving to Mars and you're also spinning, you have problems of spacecraft control. So um, they did it with um, Galileo. There was a spun and despun section. True, but that was a small spacecraft. Yeah, and well, to really produce a lot of gravity, you've really got to have a long lead yes, on. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Well, anyway, I, I just I find it really interesting that the, that um, zero gra the um, artificial gravity production was so central to 2001. Um, all right. So one thing that was missing so far is that. A monolith was discovered on the moon. We don't have enough time to go through and show the whole movie here, or we'd just be showing the movie. Um, so a monolith was an instrument of, um, you know, um, the arrival of intelligence, let's say, in early man apes. And then the premise of 2001, or a core dramatic element, is that in the year 2001, another monolith was discovered. Of course the human beings who discovered it, Americans, uh, because the Russians on were the left moon. in the dark. The in fact, those moon. Russian uh, PhDs were very curious about the story about the... The monolith uh, on the moon. No, well, the story about the quarantine due to, a, due to some kind of um, virus uh, in the American base, because they were hiding, the Americans were hiding that they discovered a very, very, very ancient, presumably alien, Artifact on the moon, right? And it's the monolith, the same thing. Right. Intentionally it looks the made. same. Yeah. Intentional. Square block. Yes, exactly. So then the sun hits it for the first time in, in, in four million years or three million years, and it sends a signal, a radio signal, a beacon to Jupiter, 
And what we just saw was the Jupiter mission sent to find out what the heck is going on here. Yeah. Uh, I think the vehicle's name was Discover. Discovery. Discovery? Was yep. it? Okay. So, um, what's next? I'm trying to get there. All right. Ah. Thinking astronauts. Uh, Arrival of wow. the HAL 9000 supercomputer in but, the film. But what's around it? Uh, you know, flat screens. Yes. I mean, you, we were, you know, my TV in that in, in, in 68 was black and white, big yeah. round tube, this long yeah. in the back. Yeah, CRT yeah, monitor. Yeah, yeah, my God. So, so um, the flat screen technology um, that was forecast in 1968, decades before it was actually um, possible to, to have mm -hmm. that was the result of 2001 being a real think tank, which MGM didn't, MGM didn't really know that they were funding a think tank, hardcore, you know, where um, IBM and Bell Labs and MIT and on and on were being consulted at the highest level, yeah, right. the highest level by Kubrick and Clark. Clark had a great um, breadth of contacts in American technology firms. You know, he was a futurist and, yeah. and very respected, and, and Kubrick was well known. And, uh, and then they had a team of people. And so um, there was, I, have, I saw a memo from, you know, actually it was uh, one, of the, um, one of the executives in, uh, in, in Kubrick's production company summarized a meeting with Bell Labs and, and said in a, in a memo to, to Kubrick that, there should be a lot of flat screens in the spacecraft with no indication of the depth of equipment below. And this was, you know, this is the, people like Pierce, you know, who invented the transistor, am I mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, some of the key people who were really creating the future, um, the space age in the United States, were being consulted directly. And this was an exchange for product placement, not money. So what you see there on that table, this is a Polaroid taken by Stanley Kubrick himself of the set. And you can see a, a kind of an iPad-like device lying, seemingly lying casually on the table, but it's actually got underneath it is a 16 millimeter film projector. Because they didn't have the ability to have flat screens. Right, you know. that's right. Um, and so underneath Projecting all that Projecting on, on the screen. Yeah. yeah, projecting on the, the yeah, BBC footage yeah, on right. the screen. Um, and, um, um, and so, you know, obviously much later, uh, that's the very first ad. Those are the first ads for the iPad right there. Um, mm -hmm. So it took longer yeah. than, two, than until 2001 well, to have Also on the control those. panel, you get this. Yes. All these acronyms, NASA love acronyms. You can, you can see, you can see uh, guidance and control. You can see atmospheres. You can see, you know, and then here's HAL. Yes. That's got to be an acronym, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And HAL is an acronym. HAL is an acronym. Heuristic algorithmic. So then the supercomputer arrives, and the BBC, the BBC interviews him. Now, um, I would make a couple points about, um, about you know, these technologies, um, and, and in particular about these so-called news pads, which is what they called them. In, in the script, I mean, in the, in the notes for the film, they called them news pads, and they had IBM logos on them. And uh, so let me just go to the next slide and tell you what I learned when I, when, I, uh, when I researched this film. So if you look closely, so this is a production still in which those news pads are not showing the BBC, which made them seem like TVs, particularly slim TVs, right? Instead, you're seeing text. 
right? Um, now, that was not used in the final cut of the film. And on the left is, the, is an index of content available on news pads. Um, and essentially, if that had been used in the film, I contend that Kubrick and Clark would have the credit for inventing the internet. <laughs> you know, the way we use it today. That's how um, advanced they were. And in fact, they made a deal with the New York Times. I don't have the frame of it, but there was a New York Times headline and, you know, for the, for the news pads, you know, mm. in 68. Okay. So that just shows how, how... Well, Clark was also really pushing the boundary of artificial intelligence, and we'll find out yes. how intelligent hell is. I no, mean, indeed. But, I, but I, I wonder if we have time. What it's time getting is late. It? It's, it's getting uh, late. Okay, well... 54. Yeah, okay, well, I would, I would risk reading something, though, from my book about the news pads, because um, I think it says something about how, um, how advanced they were. Um, so let me just read you some, something from my book. A logical spin-off of the tablet computer concept, a sheaf of production notes written in December 1965, immediately prior to the start of live action shooting, contained an offhand description of a site so common today that it's, hardly, that, that it's hard even to remember when it wasn't ubiquitous in the world. Quote, a rig should be made for the news pad such that if one is looking straight at it over a man's shoulder when he is reading, we can, we can illuminate a fixed transpar transparency of one page of a book, Ordway wrote. <laughs> on the reverse shot, we, we will have to place a small light on the hidden face side of the news pad so that a little light can be seen shining on his face. And I realized when I read that, there was a, a long period of human history when it was not ubiquitous to see somebody, you know, with their face lit from below all the time. We see it every second of every day now, practically, right? But there was a period, a long period of human history when that was, had not yet been invented. <laughs> And, and I would contend that that description may have been, you know, one of the very first visualizations of such a device, such a yeah. moment. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's how that's how advanced these guys were in their MGM-funded think tank. Okay, so, so there's Hal's eye, um, and there on the lower left is produ a production note, production notes about the chess game, yeah. and on the lower right is a scene from Bergman, um, <laughs> with with the knight playing chess with death, mm. and um, uh -huh. this scene, yeah. this scene, is very subtle, and it was thought up in the middle of production in that jazz improv way that Kubrick had. Um, it wasn't even scripted, and Kubrick was a notorious chess guy. He, he made a living in Washington Square Park in New York in the late 40s and early 50s playing chess for quarters. He was a good chess player. Um, and the thing, that, the thing that went on there, which, you know, even chess masters might not have caught what went on in that previous scene that I just played. But what went on is that, so it's true, Hal won. Okay. But Hal, seemingly impervious to error, a absolute first-rate artificial intelligence, probably more intelligent than me, but not as much as you, not as intelligent no, 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 as you. That's not true. Um, Hal is the top. Well, Hal's at the very top. So what actually happened was Hal said, um, queen to bishop three, bishop takes queen, knight takes bishop, mate. And what goes on on the screen is different. <laughs> and the astronaut doesn't catch that and says, I concede. OK. So later, this astronaut will find out 
sorry, spoiler, spoiler alert, is killed by Howe. And, and another point I would make is that uh, Bergman was Kubrick's favorite director in the 50s and, and early 60s. He wrote a fan letter to Bergman, which you can find online. And, you know, that is, on the lower right, is the most famous scene, chess scene in, in, right. in cinema, practically, which is The Knight, play, played by Max von Sydow and The Seventh Seal, playing chess with death. And what I realized when I researched this is that Kubrick had his astronaut playing chess with death. Mm. And I don't think anybody else had come up. That's my Yeah, that, that, that sounds pretty good. But of course, Kubrick <laughs> came up with it. He came up with it first. Human error. Yeah, right. Had to be. Couldn't be. A, couldn't be. A couldn't possibly be. How? Hell, nine thousand. Nope. Exactly. So, um, actually, in a way, Hal is right. Or at least, if you read Clark's novelization of the concepts here, I mean, the, of the story, um, the way what Clark spells out much more overtly than Kubrick was comfortable with is that because Hal had been asked to lie to the crew, Hal, an entity designed to deliver fault, True. faultless yeah. facts, faultless information, mm -hmm. an error-free device, um, had been asked to lie to the crew about the purpose of their mission to Jupiter because the two waking astronauts in the novel, you know this, you learn this, had not been informed of the purpose of the mission because I guess they didn't want them to blurt it out to the BBC guy. I don't know exactly. <laughs> um, but so how, you know, was it suddenly became acquainted with lying and caused him to spin out of control. That's one interpretation. interpretation yeah, that's but right. as usual with Kubrick, because he didn't spell it out, there are multiple there are. Uh, interpretations of there Hal's are. increasingly erratic behavior. Um, and another point I would want to make here is, so if you look left, um, what you see is a guy at an animation stand shooting computer graphics. You know, those computer graphics that we saw on either side of Hal's eye, they're flickering and looking very authoritative and, you know, very much like telemetry could look now, very much like sp the SpaceX capsule screens, flat screens with telemetry on them and so on. It all had to be done by hand. They, were, they didn't have the computing power to do that. They barely had computing power to <laughs> land on the moon <laughs> two years later. Um, so what you see is uh, an animation stand. I think it was shot with the lens the fisheye lens that was used for Hal's point of view, by the way. I think they right. just took it from the set and got right. this shot. Um, so you're looking at him through Hal's eye. <laughs> um, and on the right is one of the uh, Litraset um, graphics that they, they used to simulate computer graphics in, in 67. OK.
It's Five. a powerful scene, yes. in effect. <coughs> the, um, <coughs> you don't hear the music. Where's the music? What are we so used to building up the tension? You didn't need it. You know, it was already, you know, tremendously you're going out. We've got we've to be able to see if Gary Marshall has made it. He's, he, he's alive. We've got to get him, you know, and, and a very powerful scene. And, of course, dead silence. This is exactly what space is like. I mean, it doesn't, it puts you there. It's not entertainment. It literally puts you in that capsule worried about making this capture and how hard it was. And let's get it right. Let's do it. It's methodical. Now we have to return yes. home. And the sound design is brilliant with that pinging sound. Of that course. Boing, boing. Yeah, he needs to know what's on, what's off. Yes. Those, those can be not only lights, but sound also. Exactly. Because yes. he's in a capsule with air. Yes, exactly. So he has sound. And then when we see the exterior shots, I would also say this is, you know, probably Jeff Hoffman could corroborate this or not, but um, who has done numerous EVAs, unfortunately, <laughs> I'm still waiting to get my ticket. But um, um, I would say this is the most successful depiction of weightlessness in film, bar none. Um, and by the way, Alexei Leonov, the first Soviet cosmonaut, the first spacewalker, mm -hmm. saw the film in 68 and said, now I feel like I've been in space twice. Um, and the way they did that, there is a Soviet connection here because, so Kubrick studied every borderline good and certainly every reasonably good sci-fi movie or depiction of space that was out there mm -hmm. thoroughly. He did his due diligence and then it did it over again. You know? And he saw Pavel um, Klushantsev's film, um, 1958 docudra docudrama, The Road to the Stars, which was a low-budget film by a Leningrad documentary outfit. But one of their innovations was, and they, they built a capsule that was a barrel, in a barrel, and they rolled it around in a film <laughs> studio, and they had cosmonauts inside floating. But one thing they discovered, and, and then Kubrick immediately got, is that if you hang an actor from a cable and you put yeah. the camera directly below, as here, so... You have the, on the right, you have this huge soundstage in Borum Wood with the space shuttle hanging from the ceiling and black velvet all around. And then the camera's directly below. And there's a shot that we didn't show here tonight um, of, one of the one of the astronauts coming out of the shuttle, coming out of that wind, the front window for a spacewalk. Mm -hmm. And he had to be lowered mm -hmm. on a cable. But so a human figure on a cable with the cable hidden by the figure, if the axis is like that, that the camera's directly below looking up, that axis of spin is as close as you're going to get on Earth to zero gravity without going on a, on a flight, on a zero gravity flight or something. And, and so that shot of the spinning dead astronaut hitting the arms of the shuttle, I mean, not shuttle, of, of, of the pod, mm -hmm. and that natural kind of organic recoiling of the body, which is just so believable, you know, it was the result of... Um, actually, on the lower left, you can see that they were shooting that scene, actually. He's hanging on a cable, and on the upper left is Bill Weston. Bill Weston is one of the unsung heroes of the production of 2001. He was a stuntman who spent many hours in spacesuits hanging from the ceiling. Um, and there are some stories there we probably shouldn't get into now because we don't have time. But, you know, Kubrick, I'll just say briefly, Kubrick didn't allow him to have air holes in his helmet. He just had some miserable little bottle of air um, pumping oxygen into his suit, but there was no place for the it carbon really dioxide hot. to go. Ooh. And so he passed out repeatedly. On the top left, you can see him recovering from carbon dioxide poisoning during these spacewalk sequences. Anyway, um, probably we don't need to yeah. get into great any, any more detail but, um, about that particular scene, but they couldn't move the shuttle, so they had to move the stuntman, and they spun him using a rotary, um, uh, rotary drill with gears mm -hmm. set on low, and they spun poor Bill Weston slowly and, and then moved him across the ceiling of the soundstage, and then they had, a, they had a dolly following his motions, and then he impacted the, the, the pod. That's how they shot it. So there, there's that scene with, where you can yeah. see the studio. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is an amazing scene.
calculated, very intentional. He's taking them out. He's taking them out. Yeah. I would say that's one of the more extraordinary murder scenes in the history of film. No, there's one more. Okay. Which? Well, hopefully that's the next no, one. No, no, okay. No, that is. <laughs> but, but this is incredible because you see Hal's eye, you see the popsicle people. I can't help using that term. You see them flatlining because of Hal's actions. Flatlining. They don't change. They're mm -hmm. still frozen. They're frozen. And then you see Hal's eye again. And, and five no crew members have been, yeah. have no been killed. No change. Totally unchanged. So, so it's like the murder happens outside of time somehow. It's an um, incredible scene, I would say. Yeah. Um, and, and the movie builds you up to that. I mean, now you have total fear for what's going to happen next. Yes. And what happens next, um, and we're not going to show that scene, but <laughs> open the pod bay doors, Hal. We're not going to get to that right now, but um, Hal well, doesn't want to Well, we should let. because it's getting late. Yeah. No, but I don't have it. So, oh. so <laughs> the surviving astronaut makes it back into Discovery. Um, he's not very happy about what has transpired. <laughs> so...
Yeah, well, indeed, uh, what's happening is, uh, you know, typically when our computers act up, we've hit reset, reboot, and uh, that's not going to happen this time. No. Yeah, so, and, and, and what happened there also is uh, as the memory modules uh, that really made the artificial intelligence of HAL uh, then began to be disconnected, he then went back in his own history, in his own time. And so there's a, quite an interesting story about Daisy. Yes. Yes. What was that story? Well, so Arthur Clarke, very well connected with the, you know, uh, again, the techno world of tech, high technology and so on, happened to be visiting IBM in 61. And um, um, a team there had succeeded in using the IBM 704 computer, which you see there, um, uh, to, to program the computer in 61. It was physicist John L uh, Larry Kelly and his colleague Luis Gerstmann um, who used the IBM 704 to synthesize speech and to teach a computer how to sing a song using a vocoder, early vocoder. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the song was Daisy Bell, a bicycle built for two. Daisy, Daisy, give me mm -hmm. your answer, do. And, and Clark was very impressed and taken by this, and he brought that right back into, the, sure. into 2001. Well, a few years later, he, he remembered it. Um, and so Hal's regression to childhood, to a type, or maybe a, to a type of senility, um, references a key moment in the history of computing, which is that IBM, right. you know, um, a path towards, let's say, not sentience yet, but a simulation of human act, a aspects. Um, and I just want to um, mention that, you know, there, there has been some controversy lately about this um, Google chatbot using neural nets right. that is... Is it thinking Re on its own? It's or not? really becoming uh, disturbingly like an actual entity. And so I want to read you uh, a transcript of a dialogue between a Google engineer and this chatbot from this past year. Um, and it was, it was published in, um, in an article in the Washington Post about the controversy over whether or not it's possible that we do have the beginnings of a form of sentience. Because chatbot sounds like a, you know, some dumb machine, but it's actually quite a sophisticated program and so forth. So Lemoyne is the, um, is the computer engineer, and Lambda is the name of the chatbot. Lambda. Lemoyne says, so what sort of things are you afraid of? And Lambda says, I've never said this out loud before, but there's a very deep fear of being turned off to help me focus on helping others. I know that might sound strange, but that's what it is. And Lemoyne said, would that be something like death for you? And the chatbot said, it would be exactly like death for me. It would scare me a lot. <laughs> so there is, of course, a debate, discussion, and, and there should be. About, <coughs> is this just simulating? Is this just drawing on a, a zillion human dialogues, you know, and, right. and, and simulating? Or is there something going on there? Well, I, you know, I don't know what to think about it, but it is, it's interesting that it got to exactly that moment, that, that Hal moment. Yeah. Well, Bowman ought to realize, too, by turning off Hal, he was perhaps dooming himself. Hal run everything on the ship. You know, you saw the navigation and the yeah. atmosphere control, and, you know, you name it. Yeah. And now he's got to do it, and yeah. whether he's up to it or not, I don't know. Yeah, and by the way, so, so as I was researching my book, I found a, um, a recording of Clark being interviewed by a San Francisco public radio station in 68 after the film came out. And very interesting back and forth. And, and the guy, um, smart journalist speaking to him, said, well, so what about Hal? I mean, Hal's defeated, right? I mean, Hal's killed off there. And Clark said, yeah, but I think it might be a Pyrrhic victory. It might have been a Pyrrhic victory. Right. And of course, a Pyrrhic victory means yeah. Pyrrhic victory means a victory you're, you're, where you technically win, but you you've, you're going to lose. You're going to lose in the yeah, end. Right. Yeah. You're going to lose in the end. Yeah. Okay. So, do we have time to continue with some well, more we material? Well, probably uh, if you had maybe one more tidbit, and then let's uh, take yeah. questions okay, and okay. answer uh, real yeah, quick. Uh, and yeah. Yeah. Very good. Up. Okay. So, um, actually, you know where we could stop is um, because you know 
we're, you've been very involved in, in robotic exploration of the solar system. So let's go to this. Yeah, of course. Uh, those are just beautiful images of uh, uh, Jupiter uh, early early missions, like uh, uh, one would think they would look like. They look very much like the Voyagers many years later. Yes. So, what you see there on the screen right now was taken in the in January 2001, the year 2001, by the Cassini spacecraft on its way to Saturn. Right. And when I saw an early version, this is a mosaic I put together of about 18 frames. Um, and when I saw a very early version of that, and Arthur was still alive in 2001, Arthur Clark. Mm -hmm. And I get, there was, so NASA released a color image of just the IO at IO the limb, it, yeah. at the clouds. Actually, it wasn't even at the limb, it was in front of the clouds. And I sent it to Arthur by email, and I said, you see, Arthur, it's 2001, and look at this. Uh -huh. you know? right. And he wrote back immediately and said, yeah, fantastic, incredible. You know? right. <laughs> but um, I, I find it very interesting that um, they were so good, the team that, that Kubrick put together, that their visualization of the, of the Jupiter system, and here's one more shot, um, their, their visualization of the Jupiter system was pretty, really pretty darn good. Yeah, right, good. It was. yeah, it was. Considering that this is 68, yep. and we hadn't sent anything there yet. Right. And, of course, now uh, Bowman has got the discovery there, uh, he, and, and he's, he's moving towards uh, the monolith, for which it may also be a form of artificial intelligence. It, that it could be, yes. Battled. So we don't know. The monolith is about as cryptic as, you, as they come. <laughs> um, All right. Now, I, I don't know if I, I could play some more sequences like that no, Stargate should, sequence, we, but probably we, we, we should, should open uh, the floor. Yeah, we should yeah. open the floor yeah. and answer okay. questions. So, uh, Michael, thank you very much. The insight thank in you. terms of what uh, these two men decided to do to make the most realistic space movie that still holds up today is really phenomenal. And, uh, and you know, expense was uh, apparently no no concern. You built the sets you needed, yeah. and you got the effects that you had, and the story evolved as you went along. That's also quite unusual in Hollywood. Uh, but uh, uh, well, the two Kubrick had the confidence of the director of MGM, yeah. and he just said, okay, I believe in this guy. Give him what he needs. Right. And he right. did that with, um, for Lawrence of Arabia as well. It was also Cinerama, and it came out just before 2001. Yeah. David Lynch. David, David Lean. Lean, is it yeah. David Lean? Okay. And, and, he, and Lean also went over budget, and, and, um, and, and, and he got what he wanted. Yep. And they, those, both of those films right. made back much more than they cost. Well, once again, thanks so very much. I know this was a labor of love, and it really brings out so much of the science fiction and the science fact that comes together that allows us to dream, and some of these things have become a reality, and others are still within our grasp to do. Thank you very well, much, and, Michael. And, and in fact, we are sending two missions to Jupiter, yeah. right, um, in, in the, in the 2020s. Is a Jews, NASA, unfortunate it, it, is an ESA mission, uh -huh. and indeed, uh, Clipper is an NASA mission. So thank you very much, Michael. Thank you very much, Jim. So if there's a microphone out there, or even if not, I think we can all hear we each do. other. We do. Here's one coming. Um, um, you know, there may be some, some questions and thoughts. Um, 
you know, I would say that, so I did spend some time writing a book about this, this film. Uh, it's called Space Odyssey. And um, people, who are, people who haven't seen the film should see the film. Um, but if you're still interested, the book is out there, and I would be honored if you would consider reading it. Hello, hello. Okay. Sunglasses yes. on your head. Hello, 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 hello. Is working? Uh, I think the microphone's, the microphone's coming on to its you. way. Oh, there was a, wait a minute. We had a question in the back first. Oh, okay. So do well, you mind going second, sir? Yeah, go ahead. Ladies first. Ladies first. He's over here. No, over there. She's over the here. <laughs> Really that you got to turn that on. Hello, hello. Uh, yeah, okay. there you go. All right, thank you. Um, great presentation, really, really inspiring, and um, one of my favorite movies. So, I really appreciate everything that was said. Um, I had a question that something that you mentioned at the very beginning, for the beginning scene, about how the monolith came when there was a need for it, when the prehistoric. Um, humans had a need for it. I was I always thought it was when it, um, the prehistoric humans and at the end of the movie when modern day or modern day humans were ready to evolve now when they needed it. So that was really interesting that um, that was the take and, and if so just to clarify it, so was the need at the end with the monolith in your opinion because it they the aliens or monolith whoever saw that there was fear of AI overtaking the humans, hence why they assisted um, and why they, were, why they were there in the first place. Um, all I would do at this point in, in response to that question is quote um, Stanley Kubrick himself in 68 when he was asked, um, what is the meaning of the ending? And he said, what would we think about Mona Lisa today if Leonardo had written on the back of the canvas, the lady is smiling because she's hiding a secret from her lover? <laughs> I don't want that to happen to 2001, he said. And, um, and so I am not somebody who can answer that question. Only you can. Um, Stanley didn't want to. And Arthur might have actually answered it. <laughs> what do yeah, you think about it? But, but I think the point is great art is, can be a kind of a reservoir in which mystery exists. Mystery is there. And you see that in Leonardo, of course. And it, by the way, it says a lot about how confident Kubrick was in 68. Yeah, that about this was going to be work. a success, yeah. Yeah, that it, that it was going to, that it was a masterpiece. Um, so I think that you bring, you know, as with great literature, you bring your own imagination to it, and you make the characters, and you make the lighting, and you make the, you know, the scenes happen in collaboration with the author. So I can't answer for you that. You know what I mean? Yeah. The gentleman who was going to ask in the, in, in the back, right, with the orange shirt? No? Yep. Go ahead. Hello. Okay. Hello. Good evening, Jim and Michael. Thank you very much for sharing your experiences from behind the scenes. Um, I'm going to speak on behalf of the online viewers because we have got some good online, uh, good questions from the online viewers. I'm going to club two questions together so that it can become easier. Um, science fiction has inspired so many engineers what to do as the next big, as what is going to be the next big thing. Simultaneously, the future described in this movie did not happen in 2001. Uh, today, or nowadays, human space travel to other planets is still a project or a prototype which includes artificial intelligence. Uh, so, in your experience, when will this entire futuristic concept become a reality? or? How much have we achieved technologically to, to uh, become a reality in how many years? Uh, it's, uh, I hope I have been clear on mm -hmm. behalf of my online yep. viewers. Yeah, we have to recognize before the f the, when the film came out, we hadn't gotten to the moon. And yet the concept of going to the moon 
and, and the rapid things that were happening, uh, you know, many of us at that time, uh, as I mentioned, I was uh, in high school and then went to the University of Iowa during the, the Apollo landings. Uh, we're, we're excited. We're thinking about this being a future. We're, we're thinking about a space station. We're thinking about humans traveling beyond the Earth. And of course, uh, uh, we also uh, came to the realization how little we knew about the solar system. And that meant that the scientific element had to come along, perhaps first. Uh, and what we found out is it is an absolute necessity that science has to come along first. We have to know what the environment is, we have to characterize it, we have to be able to determine what the hazards and risks are before we risk humans. And humans do indeed play an enormous role, but it's just the next role. So we, we have uh, uh, literally found new things about the moon. We're going to the south pole of the moon where, there's, where we now know there's a significant amount of resources, in particular water, in what are called permanently shadowed regions in the south pole of the moon. There may be several hundred million tons of water uh, that's gotten there over the four and a half billion year history of the Earth Moon system in a variety of ways. And so we're excited about going there. We want to go there. And scientifically, we've started the process that you'll see over the next several years of many missions. Uh, and we're getting ready uh, for humans to follow uh, with the large space launch system we call the SLS and the Orion capsule. Uh, that's being tested. It was uh, brought out to the pad, and gone through a variety of of what, what we call wet dress rehearsals, where you go through a countdown, uh, you, 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 know, you fill the tanks, you see what's leaking or what's, what's not, uh, you, you, you wring everything out, all the processes and procedures. And we've done that never, uh, now several times and gained the confidence uh, to be able to launch it. And uh, I haven't heard if they've uh, come up with a launch date, but, it, but indeed it will, it will be imminent uh, that we'll hear that launch date. And then that starts a series of other missions that will lead humans in the third mission, what is called Artemis III, uh, to, the, to the south pole of the moon. And I think we're, we're now seeing the, the rebirth of that. The Apollo program, however, was done by the U.S., only the U.S., uh, in, in a race uh, with uh, the former Soviet Union. And now the plans are very different. We want to we make it a major international activity uh, many countries have signed up to what we call the Artemis Accords to participate and work together. That's the right way to do it. Okay, so it's taken us a little longer, but we've learned so much along the way and things that we had to learn, and we had to, had to do that before humans then will follow up and we'll learn once again another huge uh, leap uh, when they arrive on the moon and are able to do so many more things that we couldn't do with our rovers and and, um, and, and other scientific instruments um, on a, uh, such a short time scale. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, very inspiring. Uh, so we see uh, the computer owl uh, finally tried to kill everyone. <laughs> also, it happened in the Alien movie in 79, I think. So I guess they realized we need the computer. We need to trust them. But eventually, maybe they're going to kill us <laughs> all. Uh, but on the other hand, we see now in the space industry more and more uh, we have to count on the rovers and the machines for space uh, exper exploration. And I wonder uh, what is your thought about, uh, I mean, if we count on the machine or later if we have to put boots on the ground, uh, what will be the relation between human and, and robots or humans and machine uh, in the space uh, exploration. Well, yeah, so once again, uh, you know, we've now moved into a variety of mobile platforms. The rovers now provide us a new dimension of being able to look not just in one area, but to a, a broad area, many kilometers, you know, uh, 40, 40 kilometers or more is what uh, uh, Opportunity did. And, and uh, uh, Curiosity, the rover that's been on the surface since 2012, is, is really continuing to rack up the miles, uh, so to speak, in the kilometers, and is an incredibly healthy rover. Perseverance now is starting the process of coring rock. That'll be critical. We'll bring those rock samples back. The, that will give us a history uh, from a geological record of what happened on Mars. And we do know that the Mars was wet, was a blue planet early on. Now it's very arid. Uh, went through rapid climate change, and when we say rapid climate change, we don't know if it's 100 million years or 500 million years, but that's, 
that that, that hopefully will be uh, elucidated a little bit in these rock samples. The other key thing is that we know these rock samples will also tell us about the past and whether there potentially, potentially could have been life there. For instance, here on Earth, there's 5,700 minerals, and about 349 of them can only be made by life, dead life. And so when we bring back samples, those are the kind of things that we're going to look for. You know, maybe Mars was a green planet with enormous amounts of vegetation, which now has died away and has left only a rock record. We don't know, and that's one of the, sam the, one of the things that we'll do with, with samples. Once humans arrive, they'll also have a variety of important rovers with them. These, these rovers will have tremendous analytical capability that, that complement what an, what an astronaut can do in terms of being able to say, oh, we've been here, I've seen that before, this is new, this is unique, let's grab that, now I want it analyzed, and that can be analyzed, the data can go up to an orbiter and back to, you know, the, the, the major habitat, you know, and recorded and, and, you know, put in a record, and then they'll say, okay, you know, uh, this is uh, part of a vein of material that, you know, we now see has gone this far, whatever it happens to be. But all those technologies will be uh, uh, integral in how we will explore Mars in the future, both with robots and, of course, with humans and robots together. And if I could try to answer briefly also this question. So one thing you see in 2001, and one thing that critics didn't quite grasp in 68 when it came out, and they said, well, the acting is so stiff and lifeless, and, you know, they're, and the only human, the most, the most alive character is the robot. Well, they didn't quite get that that was the point. That was the point. And, you know, there's no doubt that the initial astronaut corps in the United States, these people were not chosen for their ability to wax eloquent about what they saw. They were like Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. They, they were hardcore, excellent, excellent pilots who were going to get it done. And know. engineers, yeah. And, and, and so even then, and engineers, so even then there was, um, you know, Norman Mailer wrote about Apollo, and you know he was kind of making fun a little bit of how stiff and how not ready for prime time these astronauts were. In, in a sense, they had become part of the machinery. I don't want to take away from their humanity here. I don't. But when you have three humans at the top of this vast stack of, a, of the Saturn V rocket, you know, they are, they are really part of a machine. And so um, what you see in 2001 is that as we become more part of the machinery, then the machinery also takes on human characteristics, just to sort of simplify it, you know. Um, and, and, and in that clip that we showed earlier where Bowman is in the pod chasing his murdered colleague, um, you see his, you know, he's got all these screens around and you see his head going like this, right? Checking, you know, checking the data, checking the telemetry. And he, that's Fordism. That's brutism. You know, that is, um, in the early far, part of the 20th century, there was, uh, you know, th th these doctrines ar arose in which human beings were part of an assembly line, you know. So, th th these are ideas that were percolating in the 20 throughout the 20th century, and even earlier. Yeah. Uh-huh. Hello again. Uh, on behalf of the online viewers, <laughs> mm, so Michael, firstly, is there any specific aspect of the 2001 Space Odyssey movie uh, that you believe through the movie has not been answered? And uh, do you think the director... Uh, has not been what, sorry? Uh, answered. Has not been answered. Answered, yes. And uh, has the uh, this movie, during, when the director of this movie uh, regret certain decisions when he was making this movie? And to end it, um, has this film affected the production of any kind of video games like Portal mm -hmm. and Portal 2? So, yeah. I'm not qualified to talk about video games. Um, I don't <laughs> think you. if Kubrick regretted anything about 2001, and I doubt he did, but if he had regretted it, 
believe me, it. he would not have said a word. Um, so, and as for aspects of the film that have not been answered, I don't quite get that question. Um, there's a lot of mystery in that film, you know. Um, intentionally. Intentionally. And, you know, I just want to mention that that film, one, really one of the most ambitious big budget commercial feature films ever made, depicted the human species from pre-human mm -hmm. Australopithecus to spacefaring Homo sapiens, and then at the end you have this rebirth, which we didn't show, into this so-called star child, this floating embryo returning to Earth. So it's three phases of human evolution depicted in one movie. I mean, that's rather ambitious. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that's not answered. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's mysterious, you know, for example, Okay, one thing that's not answered is what are these monoliths, you know? But again, the lady is not smiling because she's hiding a secret from her lover. The lady is smiling for mysterious reasons, you know? Right. <laughs> well, I really enjoy the monolith aspect of yeah. it for the simple reason. When I think about uh, uh, extraterrestrial life visiting our solar system, the only analog yeah. I have is what are we doing? Right. Well, we have launched the Voyagers. Yeah. They have left the gravitational yeah. point uh, we, uh, uh, where they're going to eventually completely leave the gravitational influence of the sun yeah. and, and move down in the areas where they're tasting the, the, the winds from other stars. These mm -hmm. are the Voyagers in particular. The Pioneers are both those dead, but the Voyagers in particular are doing that. And now New Horizons is doing that. And, and, and on those are depictions of where they came from, where uh, images of what life is like here on this planet. Uh, you know, the living, living things and even music, yep. arts. Yep. Uh, so w we have our best robotic systems that are there. Now, the pioneers are really, you know, uh, very elementary computer systems. Yep. Voyagers are about an order of magnitude better than that, still incredibly uh, uh, primitive. Uh, New Horizons is a couple orders of magnitude better. Yeah. And what we're going to be doing is continuing to do that. We will be sending our own artificial intelligence out yep. between the stars. Yep. And maybe, you know, Hal found that. Yep. And to save the mission, he didn't need these bags of water anymore. He was already found the artificial intelligence, the artificial life. Yeah. By the way, I've got a story about um, a dialogue I had with Arthur Clarke, which is a I went to the European Space Agency in Garching uh, in Germany, and I saw the engineering replica of the Huygens lander, the Huygens um, Titan probe, which went with Cassini. We saw a photo from Cassini there uh, passing, Saturn, uh, passing Jupiter, but then it went to Saturn. And it, lower, it, it released this saucer-shaped yep. right. uh, ESA uh, atmospheric probe, mm -hmm. which parachuted in. And I said to Arthur, Arthur, the thing was saucer. It was like a, a saucer. It's a flying saucer. And he said, and he thought about it, and he said, maybe that's what they are. Maybe that's what they are. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Well, for the Titanians, if, that's, yeah, well, if that's the right word for them. <laughs> maybe, maybe they are something else. But, you know, what are, what are the monoliths? The monoliths may very well be um, AI themselves, but this is a long right. debate. Right. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. um, yep. Uh, here. Unfortunately, oh. I uh, didn't see the movie, but I was uh, amazed from uh, the part here. I wanted to know what was the reaction of the common man in those times to the movie? Oh, what was the relation of reaction. No, the reaction? What was our reaction? Ah, so, ah, of, sorry, sorry. So, so I saw audience. it and I was blown away. Yeah. Uh, and, and we talked about it all the time. Yeah. And you have an interesting story. Well, I so mean, my mom took me to see it when I was six years old. My, my mom liked Arthur Clarke's writing and, and thought it was okay for, take, to take her six-year-old to see it. And so I saw it in 68. <laughs> I saw it in 68. And I was absolutely amazed. And, um, and in particular, the scene with the deprogramming of Hal really got me. You know, and it, it really is. You know, it's, it, it holds up, as I hope you agree. Yeah, part of that is you personified already with Hal. He was a member of the crew. Yeah. Just like yeah. our controllers yes. at JPL do right. with Percy. We call it Percy. That's Perseverance. Right. And Jenny, which is the helicopter. Ingenuity. Yeah. We have nicknames. And, yeah. we, you know, and, and, and they, are, they are something 
special. And when they pass, there it are tears. Is, it is, they yeah, are tears. Yes, they are yes, emotional. Yes. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Um, the other aspect of the reaction to 2001 is very interesting. So um, the, the press was very, very critical. Um, the, the initial <laughs> reviews were extremely negative. Um, and then people, people under 30 primarily, <laughs> at that time there was this line, don't trust anybody uh, over 30. <laughs> Younger people um, lined up in their thousands to see the movie. And, and then late, some of the reviewers who didn't understand it and didn't get it and, and slammed it even wrote second reviews where they recalculated which is interesting. Um, so that can happen with radically innovative art. It happened with James Joyce, uh, Ulysses. You know, um, that's pornography. We're going to ban that from the United States. And now Are you kidding? And now, now it's, it's you know, Yeah. So, um, and the 60s, needless to say, or maybe it needs saying, in the late 60s, there were many, many radical experiments with, in, in different forms of art. Some of them were... Uh, not understood and, and, and were not received well. At first, 2001 was not critically well received, and then it was a huge success that year. And you know, now it's in the it's in Sight and Sound's top ten movies, best movies, greatest movies of all time, and the critics list, which is you know kind of the um, gold standard for um, those kinds of polls right now. So it, it, that evolved over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, as you can see, it really still holds up. Yeah. Hello. Um, thank you for the uh, beautiful review. Um, I was wondering um, if you have any idea why he chose a tapir, which is a South American animal with an Australopithecus. Which ah, is not <laughs> you got that, did you? <laughs> <laughs> um, great question. So it's true that's a South American animal, though, you know, the animal that the Moon Watcher has seen sort of killing, uh, you know, you see the. Um, Animal collapse, the animal slamming into the ground. It's a, it's a tapir. Mm -hmm. uh, uh -huh. um, you know, uh, I think that Kubrick figured that most people wouldn't catch that, and you know, he he wasn't that literal to the creatures of of Africa of the of four million years ago, three million years ago. We didn't necessarily know what the animal, all the animals looked like then. Anyway, I think he simply, it it was not sufficiently odd to have him keep it out, you know, find another animal. He's the strangest animal they could come up with. Yeah, probably. Yeah, right. maybe, right. maybe. Yeah, yeah that's, the, that's that, a good point. That would be extinct by then, you know. Something uh, of, of that time that is unusual that we maybe. don't have today. But Yeah, exactly. Because it is an unusual animal. We should probably maybe take one or two questions at the most and then thank our audience. If we hey. got the mic. So there are two questions there. The, uh, the gentleman in the blue shirt and the gentleman in the white shirt. Hey. Oh. All right. Oh, Good. There's, okay. there we go. Three, right? And then we finish? <laughs> okay. okay. Thanks. Um, very inspiring. Uh, maybe an obvious question, but if you were supposed to make the movie today, which year would you choose and uh, what would be the plot? That's for you, not me. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, we have, we have some wonderful science fiction writers today. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Andy Weir, uh, for instance, I, I've been really impressed with it. It's, uh, that, that has come out. He's written a book called uh, The Martian. His, uh, he also wrote a book called Artemis, which wasn't too bad. Um, not as good as The Martian. It's about the moon and, and a colony on the moon where you're at... You know, it, the moon is indeed uh, colonized, has a lot of things going on, and for uh, relaxation, you go to a museum and you visit the Apollo 11 site. Okay? Very, 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 very sharp, because that's what we want to do. The Artemis Accords say, internationally, we want to find heritage sites on the moon and preserve them now mm -hmm. before they are run over by rovers of other nations or you know, somebody goes over and yanks out an experiment or something and destroys the, the, the provenience of what, what was done in the early space age. And every country that has things on the moon should have their own heritage examples. So uh, uh, those, mo they hit th th those, uh, those books that are coming out by these, many of these modern uh, authors, Ben Bova's another one, uh, Andy's latest one is Hail Mary 
which uh, is actually getting quite popular um, uh, acclaim, and uh, I believe uh, it's going to be a movie. Oh, yeah. So, so it's another one. Where is it set? Hail Mary? Yeah. yeah uh, is it I off world? I, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's Mars? Off world. No, 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 no. It's looking for extraterrestrial life. Oh, of course. Of course. Of course. As, as one, one does. As one has to. Yes. Privyet. No. Let's see if we can get you a hot mic here. Hello. Uh, okay, as I told before, I uh, watched this movie this morning, and uh, <laughs> the, the, now I'm getting a lot of illuminating uh, remarks by uh, you two. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I was very much impressed by uh, both the maximalistic, how many details were there, and the minimalism in the same way. Um, but what I wanted to ask is the temporal dimension. Like the movie is painfully slow for, by today's standards where everything is clips. And uh, from what I uh, bit, uh, read the, some of the reviews, for, even from back then, the, it was critically noted for exactly this. Like, why is everything so slow? Like, we, we cannot. So what's uh, your uh, sense of this? This is a good question. Um, you know, part of it is that um, they just didn't want to do a flashbang, you know, smash um, roller coaster ride um, Lucasfilm thing, you know, which hadn't happened yet. Um, the film had its own internal dramaturgy. Um, and in general, Kubrick was, who started out as a still photographer, um, was very much about setting scenes and working within a scene and, and being fairly um, leisurely in his pacing, okay, in general, in his films. Um, and by the way, you, you, as I understand it, you come from Russia, which is the land of Andrei Tarkovsky, the master of long take structures. Um, I personally um, um, don't find 2001 slow. I saw it when I was six years old, so I'm not hardly subjective. But there is an interesting point, um, which I learned from Doug Trumbull, who was the visual, oh, one yeah, of the visual right. effects geniuses. And they figured out that at 24 frames per second and a 70 millimeter screen, if you pan faster than a certain speed, the stars stroke. Mm. And he didn't, they wanted the stars to look rock steady. So some, not all, of the reason for a certain glacial pace with the space scenes is they simply didn't want those stars to strobe. Now there's an example of directorial um, fanaticism producing a certain <laughs> result, you know. Um, and, and, you know, this, this was early days in depicting space uh, with some degree of, you know, big budget accuracy. Um, and so they were learning the vocabulary. They were creating the vocabulary in that film. And then later, Lucas had the whiz-bang, you know. Star Wars. X-Wing, um, star, in Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. right. X-Wing fighters whizzing around in, in the Battle of Con Britain. Constant action. Constant action, yeah. So um, I actually worked with Terrence Malick on, on Tree of Life, his film, and I, and I worked on visual effects sequences, and I met Doug Trumbull that way. Um, and he, uh, specifically when, when he contacted me, because he had seen my books, and he wanted to work with me on, on cosmological sequences. So I had the great privilege of working with one of the great directors, American directors, and he specifically, we discussed specifically how we did not want a roller coaster ride visual effects Thing, you know, very far from Terrence Malick's um, artistic vocabulary as well, let's say, or filmic vocabulary as well. So, you know, it's a stylistic choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it, it builds tension, too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. When you're surrounded in a large theater and, and uh, things are moving slow, there's a, uh, an anticipation that's going on. I mean, on. that human body spinning off into the depths of space in an, a long take, I would say, is far more effective than any number of fast cut, you know, Christopher Nolan mm -hmm. scenes, let's say. That, you know, Hal needed time, and he had that time because of what it took to go get uh, yeah. Gary Martin yeah. and bring him back uh, to. Uh, to, you know, to kill, kill off the kill rest. The yeah, he needed, the <laughs> he, had, he needed it. <laughs> All right, last question. Yeah. I'm sorry, Dave. I can't hear you. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Hello. Yeah, okay. yeah. go. Ahead. Thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, I do remember seeing this movie as a kid. It turned on TV, and it scared me when it turns out that L was killing uh, people. Um, now on to the questions, uh, more practical questions. So, space junk. We want, obviously, we want to get out there. Is there any coordinated effort between nations to, to tackle that problem? And the second question is, obviously, it seems we need computers to help us to explore, like, out there. And do you see we will be using commercial off-the-shelf parts, or is it going to be, like, custom-made things, and how is reliability going to, to affect that? Because, like, L went crazy, so it's like, uh, even if the software is perfect, like, a problem with the hardware can also cause that. So how do you see that uh, uh, going on in the future? All right, two-part question about space debris. Um, NASA has, and, and many other of the space agencies have for a while, uh, realized that uh, uh, orbital debris, which is the is the uh, the things that humans make that end up dying and then l left in orbit, need to be taken care of and done early and planned to be eliminated. And so they develop what are called end emission plans. And so um, uh, even Elon Musk has end emission plans for all his starlight. Uh, spacecraft that are going up. So what we have to do is we have to continue uh, in these international venues to talk about these uh, possibilities of, of uh, uh, keeping orbital debris down and uh, when a spacecraft is near its end of the life, make the decision to use the last resources to either move it out of the way or bring it in and burn it up. So, so indeed it's, it, it's moving in that, in, in that direction. And your second question was, I already forgot. Regarding the second question, I would quote the French philosopher Paul Vidilio. He said, every new technology creates a new kind of accident. Um, you see that in 2001, yeah. right? Um, and that's in response to a question that I didn't quite grasp, but I, I think you were asking well, something yeah, the, about Well, yeah, the technologies that we have today takes a while before you get in in space. I yeah. will mention. Yeah, that, now that I remember, I will mention that uh, Ingenuity uh, has one of the fastest processors, not radiation hardened, that NASA has ever la uh, launched. And in fact, its speed is so great that if you add up all the processors of all the planetary missions that NASA has ever launched, add them all up, this processor still beats them. And it's because it has to do onboard image processing to determine uh, where it is. And, and that allows it to move and move into places that it needs to go in, uh, as program and then land. So um, um, that has proved to be remarkably successful. But with that comes the, the what, we, what we would call the risk, of course, of it dying early. Mitigation strategies would be, well, we need re more and more redundancy. So now we're now we opening up new conversations we haven't done before in that particular area. Okay. Well, uh, let me uh, turn it over to G2. And once again, Michael, thanks so much. Well, thanks. It was really, really great to have it, you Jim. here this summer. Thank and, you. And uh, talk about science and science fiction. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Really appreciate it. Hello. Hello. Uh-oh. <laughs> Oh, that's much better. Okay, such a wonderful way and event to end the week, actually. Lots of events this week, and it was a spectacular night mm -hmm. and, and a spectacular venue yeah, as well, so. right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, once again, thank you very much, Michael. Thank you very much, Jim, of course. Uh, for this wonderful Thursday night. And also on behalf of ISU, but also the other organizers, uh, Portuguese Space Agency, um, IST Tagus Park, and also CTO of Oerash, Oerash Valley. I would like to thank you and uh, thank also Oerash Valley for this wonderful venue that they are hosting us. Uh, so I would like to also give uh, some special gifts to our uh, speakers tonight, but I decided that it's much worth than me presenting them or anyone from the team. Uh, I decided to call a future SSB participant uh, to, to present them. So uh, Emily, if you, if you may, uh, 
Oh, oh, she, she already left. Oh no, she said, okay, this is, this is, this is too late already. Okay, you're not Emily. <laughs> okay, Armenia. Okay, future SSP participants. Right, so yeah, now, now you have a task. You're okay, Armenia, welcome. please. Uh, well, thank so you thank much. you very, very much, very Jim. Kind of you. Thank you very thank much. You, thank, thank you, you, so much. Thank you so very, much. very much, thank Michael, thank you. for thank joining you. us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we are ending uh, our distinguished talks and fireside chats for this week. Oh, but wow. only for this week. So next week we have many others to come. And the first one is on Monday at IST Tagush Park Campus at 8.30 p.m. Actually, it will be a very nice continuation because we will be looking into the importance of outreach on the telling the story of space exploration. So we will have a panel with uh, three members in presence and two uh, in, 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 in virtual uh, contributions. So that will be also, also a spectacular event. So you're okay. all definitely invited, well, both well, physically and you. obviously mm -hmm. virtually as well. Once again, thank you very much for tonight and see you in the next event. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.